Ladies and gentlemen, if you have not paid that learning innovation, creating an, an environment for learning innovation is part of the charter for Army University. It's very explicit. We're not just developing faculty. We're not just developing curriculum. We're creating an environment uh, of learning innovation. And it's not a buzzword. Uh, there is a field of it. There are academic journals on educational innovation. Uh, we're taking that approach. Um, and uh, we're devoting significant resources. We believe it is a core competency uh, if we want to um, accomplish our larger mission, our strategic mission, to change what, uh, to, the, to the level that you heard General Brown discuss this morning. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Alt. And I want to brag about her. I want to say some nice things before she speaks. Um, she is a senior researcher, I need my glasses, with the University of Kansas Center for Research on Learning in the Lifespan Institute. You heard this morning, we are very concerned about the lifespan of learners, lifelong learning. This is her expertise. She is director of advanced learning technologies. Now, all innovation is not technology, but this is part of her expertise. 28 years of work have focused on adult learning, particularly in the instructional use of existing and emerging technologies to support their improvement of teaching and learning. She's worked with the Department of Education, the Department of Labor, the Department of Defense, the National Science Foundation, the Institute of Health, and the Kansas State Department of Education and Department of Transportation, and the Intel Foundation. Uh, she works from soup to nuts, from the design, implementation, research, evaluation of these learning activities in face-to-face -face and online learning design. She is currently a co-principal investigator for the National Science Foundation, exploring the use of social media to support high school science teachers in professional learning. She works as an external evaluator with a research collaboration with KUCRL. She observes, evaluates, measures, analyzes learning. And, and we will hear that topic over and over. Uh, innovation is measured and evaluated. Uh, it, it just doesn't come like spell check and heated car seats. It, it's not easy. It's more like the, the metric system. It, 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 it comes in and you have to fight for a spot uh, in the curriculum and in your, in your, in your program of instruction. And I think she's going to discuss that. Please welcome uh, Dr. Marilyn Alt. Hi. Uh, it is uh, great to be here. This is, this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, um, I am primarily an educator, and I work with adult learners. Um, I work with adult learners who are in K-12 education. I work with teachers, principals, speech pathologists, language therapists. These are, but these are adult learners, much like the adult learners that you all work with. Um, what, what my goal is, is that you know, I, I go to work with a teacher who's in a classroom or a number of teachers in a classroom, and I analyze the professional development that they experience to improve their performance with students. This is very similar to the work done at the Army University. Um, my goal in working with teachers is that they implement with fidelity uh, and generalization in a creative manner, the, the skills or the knowledge that I am watching, which would be the content of the professional learning. And whatever that might be, my, goal, my the outcome goal is that those adults implement with fidelity in their, um, in their context. And this is very similar to the, uh, what was outlined in the Army Concept 2015 paper. All the points that are critical for adult learning were specified in that, in that paper. But the, the, um, what I thought that, that wasn't maybe as strongly stated in that paper is that, is that adult, learning, adult learning is social and adult learning where the outcome is the uh, implementation with fidelity happens only with a number of characteristics that are used a number of, of implementation strategies that the, that the learner experiences in their professional learning. And so this, this is a very dense graph um, of, of a research of a, a meta-analysis done by uh, Trevet and his colleagues on adult learning strategies and the impact of those adult learning strategies on knowledge, skills, attitudes, 
self-efficacy. And we as people who support adult learning want knowledge, skills, attitudes, and self-efficacy to be learned, not just knowledge, not just skills. So that the learning experience, so this, this line over here, this effect size line, starting with 2 all the way up to 2.0, um, is a statistical representation of the likelihood of that particular strategy to impact outcomes. Uh, a point, a 0 0.2 effect size is what you would expect someone to be able to do on their own uh, without high quality intervention. Anything at 0.6 or above is really a, a significant effect size for a strategy. So what we want to look at is a, a 0.60 effect size for knowledge, skills, attitudes, and self-efficacy. And if you look over here, the lecture mode has the least, um, least success in establishing sustained behavior. The, if you have an, you know, illustrate, if you provide an, an introduction, then you illustrate a concept, you have a larger effect size for a skills, knowledge, attitude. Your impact increases as you provide practice. Some of the larger effect size comes with uh, evaluation, both external evaluation and self-evaluation on, on the part of the learner, the, allowing the learner to reflect. This, particularly for adult learners, uh, is a significant um, feature of learning that is often overlooked. Uh, to allow the learner to reflect on not only what they've learned, but how it changes their role as a learner, how it adds to what they're already doing, how maybe it changes their perception of them as a, as a teacher, as a counselor, as a, as a troop. I, um, and then mastery, you know, and, the, and these, these elements down here are, are well reflected in the literature, but mastery uh, implies a in, in-situ coaching support. Um, so you go out of a classroom setting into the field and you support the uh, implementation of the knowledge over time. So what we have learned, or what I tend to, what I do as a, as in my profession is I go and I, I observe learning opportunities and I evaluate them on these critical criteria. Do, you know, is the learner experiencing a learning event that has a high degree of likelihood of implementation with fidelity in the field. That is, that is what we try to do. There it is. So, or more simply, you know, if you look at conceptual understanding, skill attainment, and, and application, this is another way to look at it. Practice and feedback. Um, in terms of the likelihood of that being implemented with Fidelity in the field. So coaching and, and collaborative teamwork, since adult learning is primarily a social activity, if, if you want your learner to implement what you are teaching with Fidelity uh, long term with the ability to generalize, you have to have these elements available to them during the learning experience. And the more of those elements you combine, the greater the likelihood of your effect size. So just a lecture pretty much is not going to change anybody's behavior. A lecture with feedback maybe will increase it. A lecture feedback practice, a lecture feedback practice, um, self-evaluation, self-reflection, and then coaching in the field. Then you start to get an effect size where you're going to have sustained implementation with fidelity, with uh, creative, great creativity and generalization. So that was my point one. That was, that was, I, want, I had three points I should have said at the beginning, because that's poor professional learning, not to give you a sense of what it is I want to touch on. The second one is what, what you ask their learner to do. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, you know, going from uh, low level, uh, from you know, knowledge acquisition, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. So what we want when I'm working with teachers in the classroom is I want 
a teacher who can analyze, evaluate, and be creative in terms of their implementation of whatever it is I'm teaching. And these, this is uh, the work of A. Churches, and he's done a lot of work on the use of technology in supporting higher order thinking. Um, you know, technology is great. I'm, you know, I like, you know, HoloLenses, I like mobile technology. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think that, that learners of today require that information be presented to them through technology. They want to have access to their, to their databases and to the Google and to Google Earth and to Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia. Um, but if, but you have to teach them how to use the technology in a way which allows them to analyze, evaluate, and create. So I would much rather have, much rather engage a learner without technology in higher order thinking than provide them with innumerable videos on how to implement a strategy, but not engage them in higher order thinking processes. So technology is a tool. Um, and, and all the emerging technologies are cooler tools, but we still need to stick with the basic elements that engage the learner in these higher order thinking processes. And then the, the third point is the myth of average. The, um, this, this guy, Todd Rose, is a Harvard Graduate School of Education faculty, and he has a TEDx film that is, I, I found it, um, very engaging. And he, here's the URL for it, and um, he talks about the myth of average and uses an example of um, cockpit designs for fighter jets. And originally, the cockpit design for fighter jets was based on the average uh, pilot size. And so they established the cockpit size based on the accumulation of data about the average size. And according to him, apparently, performance, consistency, reliability of performance, accuracy was not as good as the, um, as the Air Force, or I don't, I don't know if it was the Army Air Force, or anticipated. And they evaluated the, the, average, pi, the average cockpit size and, and discovered that they really, there was no average person. Uh, you know, the, the, the size of the pilots, the, uh, the arm reach, the width, all those varied. And, and we're great beneficiaries of, the, of the, the design factor, which now has cockpits which are, are adjustable to the pilot, because you get into your car and you can pull that steering wheel out and you can move the, the seat back and forth and up and down. And so once they had cockpits that met not the average, but were, were uh, accommodated to all the pilots, they were much more successful. So those are, my, those are my three takeaways. Adult learning is social and needs to be engaging, that, high, that no matter what the technology, you have to engage the learner in higher thinking. And the, there is no such thing as average. Ever, every learning experience, every interaction has to accommodate, be able to accommodate the specific learning needs and characteristics of that learner. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. We, we very specifically chose to put learning innovation first because it connects to designing curriculum. It connects to developing faculty. It connects to those partnerships. And you can already see those connections happening and, and, and how to apply those things. Uh, uh, thank you. The, the, um, Nothing sells like data, right? Uh, my next uh, panelist uh, is Dr. Doug Ward. Um, he teaches courses in innovation and digital development in Lawrence campus and Edwards campus for uh, University of Kansas. He was named the 2011 Journalism Mass Communication Teacher of the Year by Scripps Howard Foundation. He's the Budig uh, Professor of Writing in 2000. 11 and 12 academic year and has been nominated for the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award and the Hope Award for Outstanding Teaching. He's the author of, of the book, A Brand New Business. And more recently, he's been writing about teaching and technology uh, for such publications as the Chronicle of Higher Education, PBS Media Shift, Bloom 6, and the Block for Center of Teaching Excellence. 
He's the creator and curator of KUEditing.com and an online language reference source and block. Uh, you heard this morning uh, how much more the Army deals with the media, has strategies combined with the media. Um, I, I will confess, I, I, I told Dr. Ward, uh, I invited him because uh, you don't have to read his writing long to understand he is an antagonist for uh, learning innovation. <laughs> and uh, he's on our panel uh, because uh, Innovation has the fight for a spot in, in the curriculum. It has a fight for a spot in the, in the budget. And uh, we need people to, to give it rigor. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Ward. <laughs> oh. Thank you, David. I would like, I think, just to give a few metaphors that I think would help set the scene for innovative, innovative thinking and just the way that I look at education and the way that we have looked at education for too long, which is a very static environment. And we have looked at, we've looked at learning as a static activity, whereas learning is a dynamic activity. So if you'll think in terms of static versus dynamic, and with static we have, and to build off what Marilyn was talking about, lecture. How do we learn? How do we expect students to learn? We tell them something and then we, they tell it back to us and we call that learning. That's a static model. And as we're finding it, we've known for 50 years it does not work. And yet we perpetuate it. We perpetuate it and we'll talk more about that. It's easy. We can reach a lot of people. It's not that it's bad that we need to reach a lot of people and that we need to talk to people sometimes. But if that's all we're doing, that's not learning. And I think what we have not done is help our students work into this environment of dynamic information and really to help them understand how to learn. That to me is what we need to do as much as anything is to help our students learn how to learn. A few metaphors from an educator named David Thornburg that I really like to draw on and that I push a little bit beyond what he does. He calls them primordial metaphors for learning. And I think they really do help us understand the ways that we have approached education. The primary one is a mountaintop method. And that's the lecture. If you think of someone up on a mountaintop, this is the idea that information is scarce. And I need, I'm, I'm the one who has that scarce information. And you have to come to me and I have to present it down to you because it's inaccessible to you. That's how we've approached education for the most part for many, many, many decades. Another way uh, of looking at education is a campfire. And that's where we're gathered around sharing information, sharing stories about what we've done, what we've learned. It can be a very effective way of learning. Another one is a watering hole. And the watering hole is some place where everybody has to go and you never know who you're going to bump into but you can learn something from that person. You're able to share information with that person. Those informal learning environments are extremely important today because it's not about the formal always. The formal helps, but it's that informal area where people are able to learn on their own. And then the fourth one that he gives is the cave. And the cave is just the idea of individual learning. It's a library. It's your home. It's some place where you might go and read a book. You need to be able to learn on your own and in an individual way. I like those. They help us understand different ways that we learn. Let me give you two more metaphors, though. One is the barn raising. And that, to me, I think is where we need to be pushing and where I've been helping push our education is into that idea of a barn raising. And a barn raising is in, in, in a community, for those of you who don't know, I mean, we're in, we're, uh, in a rural area or we're in, in, a, in a farm country. I need to build a barn on my land. I don't, know, I don't have all the tools. I don't have all of the people who are able to do that. I'm going to bring the community in. I know how to lay the foundation for the barn. You know how to build the siding. Somebody else knows how to do the roofing. Somebody else is an expert in hauling. We need people to produce the, to, to create food for us. We need people to haul supplies for us. And by doing this and bringing us all together, I'm going to learn from you. 
I may know how to do the flooring, but I'm going to learn how to do the siding. I'm going to learn how to do something about the roofing. And by sharing all of that information, we're learning from one another as we're doing things. And the last one, then it ties right back into to my first point with dynamic versus static, is an idea that I call entrepreneurial learning. It's really the idea that a student has to take control of his or her own learning and be able to make mistakes with it. The general was talking about you can't make mistakes when you're on the field. You're out in the public. But in education, you, you need to make the mistakes there. We need to be able to set up an environment where you can experiment and you can fail and you can learn from those mistakes so that when you do go out, you have some of that experience and you're not caught blind with it. So entrepreneurial learning to me is the idea that you are as an individual taking control of your learning. You have ideas about what you want to learn and can go out and build your own sort of a program. So it's back to that idea of static versus dynamic information and tying that all together so that it's, you're constantly making additions to your education that are most meaningful to you and sharing what you know with others. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Um, our third panelist today is uh, a member of the U.S. Army. She works at uh, Army Research Labs in Aberdeen Proving Ground, uh, Jean Bettel. Uh, she is an expert in cognitive neuroscience. She studied at Brown and under uh, a fellowship, and she has um, a, a master's in exercise science from University of California uh, at Santa Barbara. She is an enthusiast for personal development. She didn't tell me that, but I know it. It, it just screams off her resume. Uh, I invited her on the panel because uh, her world is 5, 10, 20 years down the road. They research, uh, they, do, they do development uh, about innovations that we're just conceptualizing. Uh, when we talk about innovation at Army University, it's not walking out and, and cherry picking things that are available now. It's planning. What are our classrooms going to look like? What are our buildings, our structures, uh, our organization? What does it need to be uh, for the future? Uh, she will give us some insight on that. Um, she, and she sent me this great picture. You can't see it here. I wish I had it for you. Oh, don't well, worry. I'll, I'll be showing them. You'll be showing them, yes. Um, uh, she, she's also a teacher. She teaches uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, her undergraduates in, in writing. And I'm not sure how you get into neuroscience when you, you, you do writing as an undergraduate um, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, please welcome Dr. Jean Vettel. So hi, my name is Jean. I am a civilian neuroscientist. I work at Army Research Labs. Um, the mission of Army Research Labs, we sit under Army Materiel Command which means that our mission is to design innovative technologies for the future. So everything that I'm going to talk to you about today is really based on designing a capability for 2040. So nothing I tell you today is what I have to give you um, that you can take home and try it now. But what we're trying to do is um, find a good path forward in terms of how we can realize those capabilities in 2040 by the types of questions we ask today. Um, so today I have three things that I'm going to try and communicate to you. Um, the first is that I want to tell you a little bit about um, a future technology that we envision, so you can kind of understand what we're striving for. The second thing that I'd like to tell you about is some um, preliminary research results that we have now that gives me hope that we can actually achieve that by 2040. And then the third thing I'd like to do is be a little cheeky, um, that's a technical term, um, and describe some of the things that we actually need from our Army leadership um, in terms of the definition of what you mean when you say you want to know if I can predict if they're an agile leader or not. I have to have a metric. I have to have a behavioral metric for that. And I'll try to give you a couple examples of what I, I'm really searching for. Um, so those are the three things that I wish to achieve. Okay. So first, uh, what kind of technology do we envision? Um, so right now, if you talk to soldiers, a lot of times the soldiers will tell you that their biggest burden is physical. There's so much to carry. What I think that the, what we envision um, that the problem will be in the future is that there'll be too much cognitive burden, right? What is our solution now? Uh, we typically give another piece of technology. Oh, you're having a problem with situational awareness? Here are two more gadgets you should look at. 
oh, you have a problem processing Intel information? Here are three more devices that are going to try process it for you. To me, keep giving someone technology, especially that's not designed for a human, right, does not help. It just adds more burden. So what is it that we envision? Well, what we want to do is have technology that instead of the soldier having to adapt to the technology, we want the technology to try and adapt to the soldier. Okay? This might sound, especially to educators, that I'm talking a bit about a cognitive tutor, or something I'm not. Real clear, I'm not talking about that. Instead, what I'm talking about is a piece of technology that actually is going to track something about my um, cognitive state, my brain state, that's going to talk about how it is that I want that technology to work with me to solve a task. So what do I mean? Uh, what's a state? I'm going to intentionally choose the word state because it's uh, relatively ill-defined, which means that I can actually do science on it. Um, so, but let me give you some semantic examples. So how about the case whenever what you want to know, what we're really good at humans, right, is when we're at the extremes. If I slept really well and I'm on the top of my game, you know, you feel it, right? You have that little step in your stride. Um, we can also tell whenever we haven't slept very well or, and we just feel like crap, right? And you, you just have those days where you're like, I really shouldn't open my mouth today. Nothing good is coming out of it. I'm hoping today's not one of those days. Um, but those are the two ends of our spectrum that we, from introspective report, can overall get pretty well, right? What we don't have are all of the subtleties in between, where I'm going to make some errors, but not catastrophic ones, or I'm pretty good. What about if we had technology that could actually track those physiological signals that indicate that middle ground whenever we can't know, we don't have that introspective capability to know how we're going to have a problem with our performance. And then we can have that system then adapt. So let's say in the case of, actually, let me get you into some data. Um, so if this is the technology that I want that can adapt to my state, what's the biggest thing that I have to do? Detect my state. This is not trivial. Um, I'm a neuroscientist, though. So my um, signal of a choice comes from the brain. How can I collect signals? Well, this guy, this is a proof of concept. Any green student in the room will tell me that they will not put this in their head in the field because it's a ballistic event. <laughs> That's OK. I'm 2040, so I don't care. <laughs> OK, so I can put a cap on somebody. And then I can start recording the ongoing electrical activity in the brain. This allows me to do something that I'm going to call we create um, functional networks. So the electrical activity that I can record from a person's scalp is giving me a reflection of the electrical activity that we believe communicates information between our brain regions. I can then create functional networks, and I can look for changes or fluctuations in that functional network that are able to predict things about my performance. I'll give you an example in a second. The other thing that I'm really excited about is the fact that in addition to this functional data that I can do, I can take a person, put them in an MRI scanner, I can use a relatively new innovative um, structural imaging technique called diffusion-weighted imaging, and from that, I can derive an estimate of the structural connection between the brain regions. You can think about those as the wiring of the brain. I can then use that to try to understand what regions of the brain can and can't communicate with one another, and how that reflects the ability to perform tasks. So today, I want to tell you about just two real quick uh, results where we have functional networks and structural networks, and why I think those hold promise for being able to quantify human performance. Because I think one of the biggest challenges within the human dimension is that the times, the phrases that we go like, can we just predict whether a person is a good leader? Are they going to make optimal decisions? That's too vague. <laughs> I can't do anything with that. Um, but if we can describe it down to something more specific, then I can do something about it. Here are the examples. First one, driving. We have data, functional networks. We record EEG, this thing in my head. And um, what we can find is that as people are performing a simulated driving task where they're driving straight down a lane, the vehicle, their goal is to maintain their, ve maintain their vehicle centered in the lane. We're going to introduce perturbations. We're going to push the vehicle outside the lane. And we're going to measure the performance of um, how much heading error, how much deviation do they have before they correct. We can look at the brain activity. And for all of the different people that we've had in the study, we can find that there are different time frames where the brain signal is able to predict the behavioral performance. I'm going to give it a semantic label. I'm going to call that to be in a proactive state. The brain is actively controlling the behavior, and we can measure it. 
We also can have time frames whenever it's the behavior, the response to the actual driving events. That is actually what's predicting the brain activity. I'm going to call that a reactive state because the behavior overall is first dominating before the brain response kicks in. Why is that relevant? Well, this is where I think we can go and design technology that will adapt to the user. So if we can monitor someone driving in real time, and we can see that overall they're going into a reactive state, that, that the behavior is driving it, well, couldn't we then have a technology that says, oh, you need me to kick on some of the automatic driving algorithms that we're developing, right? But those automated uh, driving algorithms are not going to be very good, right? We've been trying to make machines as smart as humans for decades and it hasn't happened yet, so by 24, I'm pretty sure it won't either. So we want to make sure that we have a trade-off whenever we know that the human is going to outperform the algorithm because, say, they're in the proactive state, then the human takes control, right? So hopefully this is starting to give you a little bit of a flavor with one example about how we might get a technology that could actually track something about the state to then influence performance. Okay, driving, you might not particularly care about that. This is Army University Symposium. So I'll give you one more example. And that example is going to come from learning. So what we had is um, folks learn a motor sequence task. Um, you can think about it as kind of playing a piano sequence. So five fingers, five buttons on the, on the screen. I, don't, I wasn't allowed slides, otherwise I would show you. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so on the screen, the button comes up, which button you're supposed to play, right? And what we can do then is track, and sorry, and the folks in this study um, are doing this task. They're learning these motor sequences every day for about six weeks. Um, and what we can do is we can image them, get brain imaging at different time points, um, and we can overall start looking to see are there um, signals within the brain that talk about how fast their learning is going to occur, right? So in this task, we've operationalized our metric by saying that they're going to learn the motor sequence because they can start performing the motor sequence faster. Okay? So that means we can then compute the behavioral performance for each person, namely how fast they're, uh, the speed at which they're producing these sequences. Are you with me? Okay. You all weren't nodding, so I wasn't sure. Um, and then what we can ask is, um, on these different sessions where the folks are at a different part on this learning curve, we can ask, are there any brain signatures that help us know where they are? We can look at functional networks um, while the person is producing this task. And we can see that there are different functional network patterns. This is where it's going to get a little kludgy because I don't have slides and stuff. But imagine that my fingers are um, nodes in the brain. And overall, we can say, let's say, this sort of configuration where there are lines between them overall indicate that this person is going to learn quite a bit during this session. But then there are other configurations that we may see where in that particular person, they don't learn a lot, right? So if we overall could start using some of the state, right, what their brain state is in that day, um, to drive whether or not we train that day or how much we train, or maybe we have the different types of training, right, that we'd have ways to mitigate that, that would be helpful. Okay. The other thing that's really cool is that same study, we can also look to see for the structural connections, for the folks that learn faster than the other folks in terms of the speed that they learn the motor sequence, are there any structural connections in the brain that can account for that variability? And the answer is yes. We have found some of those too. This means I'm going to start getting myself into the very muddy waters that most folks that I brief ask me. Does that mean it's a nature and nurture thing? Does that mean that things are trained or that you have to be born with it? I'm going to jump away from that question um, because I think it's a mixture of both, right? But I think if we can start, and this is my third point where I think we should move forward in the future, is I think that if we can start trying to get the questions out of are leaders trained or are they born? Um, are you creative or are you not creative? Those big semantic labels, what I call them, I can't do anything about that, right? It's sort of the wrong way to ask a bench level scientist to help you reach an army capability, if I could be so broad and not lose my job by saying that. Um, but what we could do is say, what I want to know is this learning outcome within a classroom. This is where I think that these sorts of methodologies, we're now ripe to try to take them someplace for an army relevant challenge. And I think the army um, university is a great place where we might find some avenues to say, here's this unit. In this course, they're going to start trying to predict or trying to learn how to make decisions in these operational scenarios. So that doesn't mean I'm going to predict whether they would ever make a good decision about an operational scenario. But we're going to operationalize it that for this unit, 
within these couple weeks, these are the right answers? Can I start tracking anything in their brains that are going to allow us to predict those performance outcomes? That's it. Wow. Uh, you all exceeded my expectations for today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I think I have questions for each of you, and then we'll kind of go into the uh, surprise questions for you, the, the ones we planned on. Um, as, as I listen to you, uh, Dr. Alt, um, I, I've been in that position. I've seen similar graphs. Um, there's, there's kind of a, a joke in academia, how many academics does it take to change a light bulb? And the response is, who said anything about change? And so um, getting people to change, usually there's a pat on the top of the head uh, that says, well, that doesn't work with my students or my school or with my curriculum. Uh, we do just fine with, without, with our traditional methods. And sometimes um, they're willing, they're sold, and it's tough to get people to develop those other modes when they have no experience in that. What are some tools, some mechanisms, some methods you've seen successful in bringing that type of innovation to the classroom and selling it? There, um, there's a, um, in 1975, there was a, a researcher who identified a very simple um, phenomena that people teach like they're taught. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people, it was good enough for me, you know, I learned how to do it, so I can teach this way too. So um, one strategy that we have tried is in our, in our professional learning for the teacher is to engage them in the same experiences that we want them to use to engage the student, where they go from the knowledge to the practice, feedback reflection, practice in the field with feedback. Um, and you know, our anecdotal report is that, that aha, you know, I, I get it. But it, it involves um, changing how they experience learning in order for them to change how they engage learners. That would be my answer. I like that hat, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fashion risk. Yeah. Uh, and, but Doug has a. No, I want to know whether it's recording your brain waves now. It's not actually. Right now. <laughs> Uh, I was too nervous about doing that in real time. <laughs> so that's what, I mean, it is a difficult, you know, um, faculty at the university, sorry, Doug, are, are as entrenched in, I mean, it, it is a very common problem. It's, yes, it's, yes. It's, it's well, I think that change, that idea of change, it's, it's a matter of incentives, largely. You have to have support from the top, but there have to be incentives right. for people to take on that change. And I don't think that we have created those incentives very well, at least at the university level, for people to take on those risks and to try new things. Okay, sure. Any other thoughts? Um, Dr. Ward, um, when you were speaking, you used words like uh, uh, self-directed and personally valuable, and, and there's lots of um, work, and I think we'll hear about it later this week, about students taking responsibility for their own learning mm -hmm. and being personally beneficial. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the faculty member has a syllabus or the accreditation says you have to teach these things in this amount of time. And I see faculty struggle with letting students be self-directed knowing that you want them to learn these specific things. Uh, how do you reconcile that? What, what have you seen successful? Well, I think you're talking about barriers to change, and I think that's one of the barriers to change. I mean, when we have, when we have very static or very strict accreditation rules that, that are not allowing us to change, and, and it, depending, it depends on the discipline, absolutely. We have to have some sort of standards for it, but there needs to be flexibility within there. I think that, that what I work with faculty with and what, with, what, are the, what the best faculty are doing is looking at it not so much as covering content. And that's how we have approached education, I think, is covering content. Let's, here's what, let's put all that we need to know into a barrel and spray it at everybody and we'll hope that, that most of it sticks, which it doesn't. So I think that you still have to bring it down to what are the main things that you want students to take away from, their, from your class or from a curriculum 
or from a university and pare it down, you still have to be able to have all of the, the facts and the information are still very important, but you have to be able to do something with them. You have to be able to make sense of them. So I don't have all the answers to that, but I do think it is about scaling back our expectations for simply regurgitating information and about saying we need to know all of these things. You can find those things very quickly on your, on your mobile device. Right, right. But what do you do with them? That's what's most important. Okay. Your thoughts? Well, I, I think that, uh, and you get that again, every classroom you go in, you get the, the teacher who says, I, gotta, I teach the content. You ask them what they teach, they say, I teach math. They don't teach middle school kids math. They teach math, and they teach the content. And my observation is that they don't trust the learner to mm -hmm. Uh, engage in a process that the, of the co-development of knowledge, a co-development of learning together, like a dialogic process where the, the, uh, with the direction from the teacher. They, just don't, they, they have too much to teach and they don't trust the kids. And so um, it's, it's a very difficult it's process to, um, I mean, to get them to try. It, even if just to try it in one area, try it and then maybe try it in two areas. But try to turn your class around so that, that you watch and support less, more and talk less. And yep. flip your classroom, flip so that the presentation is outside the classroom and the classroom is used for, for digesting the information and for problem solving. Um, Marilyn and I were talking about this. It's, it, we have to be able to move beyond this mentality that if I don't tell it to you, you're not going to know it or you're not going to understand it, or you're not going to learn it. We have to set up environments, we have to set up curriculum, we have to set up assignments that help students do that, but it doesn't mean that I have to tell you everything that you're going to learn. And they don't like it. We have done a great job in, in particularly the kids I think who are in high school and up through college right now in, in sitting and getting. We, the system of edu education has done a very good job teaching them to sit and be quiet. But that, that is not the kind of learning that um, is sustainable out in the field or that's creative. Um, so, but I think the kids who are now um, maybe upper elementary, middle school now, I think teaching in those grades is really starting to change, to be more uh, project-based, to be um, more, you know, using more flip technologies, to be more engaging. I think you're, you're going to see that increase particularly in the, with the schools here on the fort, you, they're much more teaching. It's very different. If you go in an elementary school or a middle school, it's very different than what you guys saw when you were in elementary school. And so when those kids get to college and to post-secondary education, I think they're going to be much, they're going to expect to be respected as learners. But the kids that today are still struggling with it. They, they don't like you to make them think. They just want you to tell them. Thank you, um, Dr. Vittle. Um, as you were talking about, and, and I'm going to use a word that you didn't use, this increased self-awareness of how my brain is functioning mm -hmm. or not functioning as, as how as I would like it, and I'm making choices mm -hmm. um, that's very much connected to my identity, mm -hmm. this higher level of self-awareness and what I would like, how I would like to see myself, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you didn't mention this, but a next step is if I share uh, with someone else right. what, what's going on with, in my brain and that today's not my best day and, right. and, and, the, and the consequences of being assigned more or less because of that or being ranked higher or lower yep. uh, or categorized like you, like you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I saw 2040. Uh, is, is there, are there things that you've seen and especially in a classroom that uh, gives you some insight about how we cope with those types of things and that, that higher level of self-awareness? Um, I haven't looked particularly at those, mostly because really to, to get us to the point of what you're saying, which is to understand how it is that we sort of self-regulate what we say in terms of team dynamics, I think we start, first need to start with looking at how it is that teams work together and how a given team organization will influence the way that the decisions are made. So I was just yesterday uh, visiting with the Mission Command Battle Lab, 
because what I'm really hoping to do next is we have some proof of principle, promise, right, from these um, technologies and these approaches on, you know, motor sequence tasks and, you know, for a hundred years in neuroscience labs that I was trained in, right, we go after these questions with these tasks because we want control, because we want to make sure that we know how the brain works whenever we're at the end. And I really think we want to try to move into some of these other domains, other these I mean, tasks where we lose some of the control. We can no longer go back to saying how the brain is, what the brain is actually doing to do that task. But we can have more about, well, what is this brain signal predictive of this performance? And so when I was yesterday at the Michigan Command Battle Lab, we were trying to talk about ways that we might be able to work with the um, college here, right? And that there are these different units to go through. And if we can start looking at how teams, how these groups um, perform on different tasks, an outcome of uh, making good decisions, command decisions, right? Whatever that may mean, that's what I need the local expertise to help define. But if we can do things like that, we can start saying, okay, this is how they were configured in the team with their roles. It's that same team that's going to work together all year long, is my understanding. Okay. Um, so, but they're going to get reconfigured. Right? And how can we look to see how their um, reconfiguration changes their dynamics? So what we really are trying to kick off now is some research where instead of just looking at the ongoing brain act physiological signals, what about if we started building networks of people working together where we actually brought in some of the previous social um, information, right? So you can actually call, in a, call information from Facebook or from their phones in terms of who are they talking to the most, right? To understand where are your sorts of conduits of information across people, and how can you use those social networks to inform how it is that actually a given team, this is getting to your question, I promise, um, how a given team actually works, right? So the only way that I can start figuring out how we could do science to address your question is to say, instead of just looking how the team performs in terms of their own physiology and the outcome performance measure, what about we looked at how that team performs whenever we take into account some of the previous or ongoing social interaction that occurs in that configuration versus another configuration, right? And so that's why we're really hopeful that we might get some local support here to start trying to kick off some research projects within the college where we do have this ability to really work with teams moving through to try and see if we can track some of these physiological signals um, to get these baselines of performance that we need. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, since this is the learning innovation pa panel, what are the maybe surprising high impact practices that you see right now? What are some things that, uh, that we should just be putting in our classrooms, uh, techniques that we should be doing that, that you see right now? I think there's, some, there's gonna be um, some room for um, more augmented reality. Um, um, in, in some learning situations where you, we're, we're uh, looking at a National Science Foundation project right now where we, so we're working with, with kids who are, um, maybe have some social emotional issues, maybe have, you know, autism or Asperger's syndrome and they, so we could provide them w in class with a holographic prompter, you know, to support their learning as uh, to support their social exchange, you know, in an area that where they're like, particularly their uh, the challenges with them are, you know, appropriate speech, appropriate, um, you know, um, socialization, and so you'd have a little prompter that would help them out. I mean, something like that. Um, I think was that's an interesting, innovative, and in. the holo lens is just coming out, or yeah, it's maybe out. Maybe coming yeah. out. It's we out. were talking about that, and I think we both agree on that. That that I think the idea of augmented reality has a, has a lot of potential. And that virtual reality takes you out of your environment, whereas augmented reality adds to your environment. You stay within the environment where you are, and I think in combination with some things like haptics, which would be our, uh, a tactile function that allows you to control things, those are the sorts of areas that, you know, I probably in the next 10 years are, have, I see a lot of potential in. But I think, you know, mobile's getting smaller, faster, and more. I think, um, I mean, that's the, 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 the technologies that allow us to be connected, I think, are just going to continue to explode. I don't even think we have a, uh, uh, an idea of how, how those are going to expand in terms of our being able to stay connected to our networks, um, receive information from our networks. I mean, we, you know, you maybe get mad because you can't follow your kids on Find My Friends. They don't let you follow them. Or, 
you know, the, um, or you do follow them and you're not happy where they are or whatever. So you, I mean, it's just going to, I think, increase the opportunity to strengthen social groups and learning groups. I think, go ahead. Okay. Well, I think one of the, a couple of the things that, that I'm seeing and have had a lot of success with, one is team-based learning. And team-based learning is, is the idea where you are learning certainly within a group, but within that group you each have assigned roles. And those roles change so that it gives you the opportunity to practice being the group leader or the, uh, or the, the gadfly in the group or the synthesizer in the group so that it forces you to look at scenarios and information in lots of different ways and, and to try out these roles to see your comfort level and to see where you are and how you can, what, what you can gain from each of those roles. I think that helps students quite a bit. The same thing with peer, peer learning where you are, it's not just coming from the instructor, it's coming from those that you're working with. It's coming from those who you know and are, are closest to. Uh, something similar to that that we've had, been having quite a bit of success with is a two-stage exam where if you take an exam on your own and then work in a group afterward and you have two grades in it so that you see how, here's how I thought about this on my own and then when I get in my group, we're taking the same exam again and I now have an opportunity to persuade you and you have an opportunity to persuade me and maybe together we know more and it gives you an idea, a better idea of what I, what I missed and what I need to know. I was going to comment that I think that um, in terms of an experimentalist uh, view of this kind of question, if we thought of um, during the course of um, learning on a particular project, a, a lot of times we always just think of the outcome at the end of, you know, were they successful or not the, mm -hmm. at the end of the project. And really to do the ki types of, um, you know, tracking of state to know how well we're learning, we sort of need to start thinking about how we can have touch points along the way too, right? So if we're thinking about how well our commander's making an operational decision for a mission, well, it's probably uh, their ongoing situational awareness and how that builds throughout the mission. Well, can we have touch points then within the mission that we're sort of doing some kind of query of the situational awareness so we can understand how that can kind of build into the final success? So that's where I think that there's a nice overlap in terms of what we could think about doing within the classroom that kind of builds us into that, that mm -hmm. ongoing metric of performance, um, it, even at shorter time intervals than I think what we're used to thinking about, right, which is blocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, another, another area that, that I think is very relevant here is an idea of, of just-in-time learning, that rather than telling you everything you need to know up front, that when you get to a situation, you need to be able to drill down into something and learn it on the spot. And I think that's a, that's a good model for technology that we've, that we've tried to adopt with our students is that we can teach them technology at the beginning of a, of a course or at the beginning of a, of a curriculum. But if they don't use it along the way, it atrophies. So they may, they may learn to, do, to use some, set, some technology this year, and if they don't use it next year, they've forgotten it by the time they, they, they need to know it. So they need to be able to have some sort of a function to be able to pick it up right away and to learn it quickly and apply it. Thank you. Um, I think the word you used was adaptive environment. Uh, for, for the, Should we ask if they have any questions? We're going to do that. Sorry. Yeah. I know, I'm going to get it. I totally got it. Um, She's getting signals through. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll ask one more then. Um, students bring their own adaptive devices to class. They bring their own laptops. They bring their own phones. And, and, and they're doing this themselves at, so, at some level. Um, is this a positive Thing. How can we manage this in a, in a positive way? Uh, because you walk into a classroom now, the, the notebooks go up and mm -hmm. it's, it's typing the ent entire class. So kids bring, kids at KU have the average three devices. The, you know, the, the, the stress on the Wi-Fi is, is outstanding. So, um, but I, I personally think it's a good thing 
the, the access to information, but the, the, you know, it's going to force the instructor. Either the instructor says, turn in all your devices when you walk in the room, or the instructor engages the uh, youth in these devices that are part of their lives. And I, I you know, whether you use them to, you know, t you know do interactive test, you know, testing or evaluating or anything, it's just, I think it's a mistake to try and ignore them. I think it's, it's important for us to be able to help students learn how to use those devices. And I think that's what, where I rebel against people who say, okay, you come into the room, you check your device at the door, and it never comes on. I think there are those times, and there are those times when you need to tell students, okay, the device is off, the device is down, you're paying attention, and we're going to do something. But as educators, we need to help students learn to function with those devices so that it's not just I'm texting my friend and I need to check my text or I need to check my Twitter feed. How can I use this as a tool? And I think that's what we don't do very well and have not done enough of is to help students use those devices as a tool. And as those devices become smaller and more powerful, you're going to carry an enormous amount of, of computing power with you all the time. And if you Right now, we're using just a fraction of it. Right. right. And that connects to your statement about um, just-in-time learning. Yeah. We're carrying right. it with us. Right. I'm going to ask one more question. Okay. Selfish. I don't want to. <laughs> uh, so how should we rethink the classroom, or what a classroom is or is not, or, or especially with lifelong learning? The classroom is a flexible environment. I think what we have created too much of is the classroom. I'm going back to my idea of static and dynamic. The classroom is a, has been a static environment. It's set up a lot like this. And there are expectations that you have when you come into a room like this. And your expectation in this is that I am going to sit and listen. And that's okay for an environment like this. We need some of that. But if that's the environment where we bring our students into all the time, they get into the habit of, okay, now what are you going to tell me? Rather than, what am I going to learn? And I'll give you, I'll give you an example from, from a class that I had a few years ago where I had them, I had the same, two sections of the same class. One was in a very traditional room with lap desks and crowded and it was hot and I had 35 students in this room and all lined up. The other one was in an open space with tables and chairs. They brought their own computers. And that's the room that, I mean, that was the dream room for me because it's flexible. Those students were engaged right away. The other class, I thought, what is going on with this class? No matter what I did, they were not with me. Even the good students, and those, there were those who really wanted to be there. They were struggling with that environment. I took them over into, that other, into the other room. I was able to get it for a few days. I took them over there. The change was immediate. The change was startling to the students. They recognized when they got into an environment where they were around a table with others, they started talking with one another. I do this sort of an exercise with graduates, with GTAs, with graduate teaching assistants at the beginning of a semester where they come in for a session and it's like this. I say, okay, now move the chairs and move the chairs in a circle. Immediately they start talking to one another. Now you're facing somebody and you start to, you feel comfortable. I can introduce myself to you. I feel more comfortable talking. It shrinks the size of the room. Right now we have this giant room and, and there are ways of doing active learning even in large rooms. We have a, a classroom with, that's a 160-person active learning room at KU that's, that, that's a new room, and it works wonderfully because it breaks down 160 into groups of nine. And what we're finding is that by doing that, students are more likely to participate. They feel more comfortable in, in, that, in that environment. They can learn from one another, but they, can, they also feel like they are in a smaller room, even though it is a, it, it's still a large place. So I think flexibility. That's, that, to me, is the key. I don't know that there is any one configuration for a room for a learning environment, but it needs to be flexible. And, and it needs to have multiple modes of presentation, not, mm -hmm. not you know, the podium that's stuck to the mm -hmm. ground with the, all the display devices, but you need to be able to move your displays around. Students need to be, like through a, 
Apple TV or a similar device, you need to be able to um, share display potential. Um, uh, it's going to be uh, social and mobile. Even if it's all online, it's got to be social. It's got to be allow for, uh, and, and the instructor has to change. I think, I mean, we have to engage students more in the co-creation of knowledge. Um, teach them how to, you know, to be cooperative learners. And there are strategies for teaching kids to be cooperative learners, but the space, either online or virtual, I mean, real space, has to support that. Thank you. I'm certain we have questions. And so let's go to some of our questions. And we have sprinters with microphones, I promise you. They're, they're highly trained athletes. Good morning. Um, Beth Leader from the Intelligence Center of Excellence. Um, and I have a question mainly for you, although I would love to talk to you later. Um, I'm a recovering math teacher. I taught math in the <laughs> public education system for quite some time before I joined federal service. And I, I saw a meme recently of a calculator and it was, remember when your seventh grade teacher told you you wouldn't always have a calculator available? And it got me to thinking as I left the classroom, calculator use was a big deal. Are we going to let the students use it? Are they going to lose skills? So my question for you is, to make room for innovation, do you have any techniques in working with faculty to winnow out the, what is not necessarily as essential now as it used to be, such as learning multiplication tables or some of the things that we used to drill on in the math classroom in favor of being able to go deeper on other concepts. Have you done anything with your faculty to help them figure that out or, or work through that issue? Was that me or you? <laughs> well, the, um, you know, I know you are, all have heard about the Common Core, you know, <laughs> debate that the, the the national, most states have adopted the new Common Core standards, and it's a similar struggle that you're talking about, that, that a new set of standards have been um, adopted by many of the states requiring a different type of teaching. And so how do you get, how do you get them um, to, how do you get a teacher to change that, whether it's a faculty or whether it's a high school teacher? And um, you know, it's, it's a, a long, arduous process of collaboration within the, the school and the district with support from administration. I mean, it's not an overnight change. But, um, but I'd still go for those times tables. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me give you an example, I think, of, of from the Lawrence Public Schools that they have done very well. And it's a, it's a technique that we've tried and, and use a lot at, at KU as well in that we don't, we can't force faculty members to do anything. Anything, anything. Right. <laughs> but what you can do is seek out those who are wanting to change and finding the key players in different areas and use them as leaders. And when you get buy-in and you get people to show you what you can do, it, it does help spread, and I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an example from a hundred years ago that, that's in my book that, and from uh, from extension services, and that extension services in agricultural areas were trying to get farmers to adopt different sorts of techniques, crop rotation, things like that. So what they would do is seek out the farmers that others might pay attention to. And then somebody, they'd, they'd plant alfalfa as a rotation crop. And somebody would go by and say, college alfalfa. You know, it, 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 it's, you know, as a demeaning. Well, then they'd sort of watch it, and then alfalfa plots started popping up here and there. And crop rotation started to spread. So it's that idea of if you find the right person, who becomes then a champion within an area to bring other people along, it really does make a difference. We have one up here and one over here. Hi. Hello? Oh, hi, I'm Elliot Chu from the University of Arizona. Um, the question that you had asked about incentives, I just want to comment on that mm -hmm. we um, just com converted most of our science and engineering um, introductory classes to active learning. So this semester we have 8,000 students enrolled in such classes. 
Um, and, the, and the thing that we did was to provide um, institutional support for these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So along the lines of, of creating um, champions, we have these faculty learning committee communities mm -hmm. which are kind of building and, and growing so there are more and more faculty involved in that. Um, we also have a number of awards that we give out for teaching to um, incentivize that. And we public, we've been publicizing it very much so, both publicly through local media as well as um, through research that's been doing. And finally, the other thing I want to mention is that um, along the lines of what Dr. Ward said was that we've um, been converting a lot of classrooms. So we have a classroom now that we have about, I think, four or five new classrooms supporting these kinds of activities. And so kind of that, that larger institutional support is really important, mm -hmm. as well as having the bottom-up part. You have to have support from the top, otherwise right. it won't work. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And tenure. Tenure somehow has to be, uh, and that's a very difficult issue to get to get teaching to be an integral part of tenure sure. and promotion. Uh, Jim Yiannopoulos with Central Texas College. Uh, a couple of com I could have had dialogue with each of you on all of your comments, and well, 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 well done. Uh, one of the things that that I've been focusing on, and my problems are not the students. My, our problems are the faculty. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, trying to get change because, as you said, you know, we teach like we were taught. Uh, we do a lot of things. The Army did things like the Army was taught. We, we changed that. Uh, I was on a team in Vietnam. We changed that. Uh, so things have changed. Change is very difficult. One of the things that we're focusing on are, are digital natives, and I, I know that you mm -hmm. probably have come across that, that uh, terminology before. These are the 18 to 35-year-olds who don't look at things the way that we... <laughs> We, I guess I'm putting myself <laughs> in a category, uh, as I do, but uh, they look at—they don't even look at time the same way we do. So, in a world of of innovation, a world of shrinking uh, uh, funding, and a world of more uh, metrics for and and tighter restrictions on on what we do and how we can do things, uh, being more visible, uh, as General Brown talked about. How do you see? Because I see the classroom, you, you talked about classrooms, you've talked about instructors, those are tools. We, you almost hit on it when you talked about the learner because those are the folks we need to focus on. How do we focus on a digital learner? A digital learner is the kind of person who, when I do research and I'm trying to find an answer to something, I ignore everything in between. Digital learners don't do that. They go back and forth and they, and they pick up all this knowledge as they're, as they're going through the process. Uh, they, they look at tests as a collaborative effort. Right. We look at tests, right. you're cheating if right. you're collaborating right. on a test. So all of those things have to change. And so focusing on that, uh, on that learner, time-based versus competency-based. You know, we've, we've been doing competency-based education at CTC for 40 years now with our high school programs and so forth, uh, and, and now college programs. So I, I think, if we could focus more on the learner and uh, bringing these these tools to him, you've talked about bringing all of the the, the iPhones and stuff. My my seven year old grandson knows more about that iPhone than I'll ever know. So, anyway, just a comment, and I don't know how you take that from from where we are, but we've got to make those changes and focus on on the learner. Thank you, sir. Oh, absolutely. We have had we've had a teacher centered. Curriculum. We've had teacher-centered right. learning rather than student-centered learning. I agree. Right. <coughs> yes, back here. Oh, one more time. We need to get your mic. Okay. Thank you. No? We have a mic over there. Okay, let's start over here and we'll get back over here. Delvo, Army University, a fascinating panel and really strikes to the heart and soul of one of the primary objectives of Army University is how do we design uh, learning environments that develop those critical thinking skills that we know our soldiers, leaders, and civilians are going to need today and in the future battlefields. And as we look at it, one of the, the biggest obstacles we feel like we have to overcome is the assessment because it's the assessment that a lot of the teachers tie their teaching to because they know at the end of the day, at the end of that course, you're going to have to assess that learning. And so that's what seems to lead to those lecture type uh, knowledge transfer instructional uh, techniques that they use. 
because to assess critical thinking, it, you know, usually you have to have an essay, whereas to just uh, assess learning or knowledge, uh, understanding at those lower Bloom's taxonomy cognitive levels, you can do fill in the blank, multiple choice, true and false. Mm -hmm. So in terms of assessment and changing that, breaking that paradigm of teaching how we taught, static versus dynamic learning, you know, how do you develop an uh, assessment that instructors, and, and from our, one of our challenges is a lot of our instructors don't have the academic degrees that uh, you have out in the university, so not necessarily able to assess at that higher cognitive level. So have you seen any innovative techniques for using assessments uh, to, which would drive uh, how that instruction is delivered and get to the right dynamic and the critical, you developing those critical thinking mm -hmm. skills? You want to take it? I mean, I can, uh, portfolios. I mean, that to, that's, that to me would be uh, a, a natural, and that's what I do in a lot of my classes is give students the opportunity I, I, to create and to show me along the way what it is they're, they're, they're doing. And I'll get back to that idea of entrepreneurial learning. I give my students in, in one class the challenge of using digital tools and information to solve a problem or to answer a question. And they'll look at me and they'll say, well, what do you want? So I don't know, what do you want to do? And it drives them mad. But that's that idea then of, a, of, of sort of a portfolio that they come out with. They come out with something that I can then measure and I can create a rubric for it to, sh to, to evaluate it and to, to give them an idea of here's what I'm looking for in terms of the elements and what you have put into it. And it's not just a dump, and all, a dump it all at the end, it's that I'm working with them along the way to help them build those skills and to challenge their thinking along the way and have you thought about bringing this in and what about this and what about this. I, I don't have all the answers to that. That's still one of the, that's still the biggest challenge I face is getting, is elevating the critical thinking of students. It's a challenge. And I think that at, at, at my center, one of the things that we're, we're looking at too is finding and creating rubrics that help evaluate instructors, not just on right. the student teaching evaluations, but on the portfolios that, the, that an instructor puts together as well. So I think that rather than that high stakes exam, what are the smaller pieces that you could put together along the way to show that? And that's part of the challenge though, because it's very time intensive. It is. Yeah. It's, What do, I, what do I need to do to get an A? Right. I mean, that's what, that's. Which sets itself up for that lecture-based knowledge transfer uh, type of instruction. Right. I, I think that the, uh, the, the formative assessment process that goes on during instruction is, is most, inform most valuable in terms of um, individual student learning outcomes. And, and the process of student self-assessment and self-reflection is key mm -hmm. for learning. But if you must do that large-scale um, assessment, um, I, uh, I know, again, going back to the, you know, the, the introduction of Common Core into K-12 education, the, the whole testing um, uh, business is moving towards assessment of those higher-order thinking skills that are required in the Common Core. Um, so I know that, that at KU, the Center for Teaching Excellence, um, Center for Educational Testing and Evaluation has an initiative on that. I'm sure there are many other institutions that, that uh, do that also. I, I don't personally find that instructionally useful. Uh, it doesn't t teach a, tell a teacher much at all about instruction and student learning, but it does inform the larger group, and I guess there is a place for that. <laughs> and are we back here? Okay. Yeah, it works. I'm Arthur Hernandez. I'm from Texas A&M uh, Corpus Christi. And um, I have just a couple comments. First is in terms of innovation, um, I think in terms of risk, 
And we work on trying to reduce risk for the students as well as for the instructors. So in terms of the instructors um, who are especially concerned about student evaluations, we need to make sure that there's a mechanism for them to totally bomb mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. be injured by right. that right. if That's they're right. going to be engaging in something innovative. Mm -hmm. And there are a variety of other things related to risk. For students, it goes back to the comment that was made earlier about the primacy of assessment and accountability purposes of assessment. And one of the things that we need to talk about is we need to talk about distinguishing between what it is we're wanting to accomplish in that training or in that education. Depending on the purpose, the nature of the assessment's gonna be different. So if you're training someone to operate a particular piece of equipment and there's a specific protocol that needs to be followed for it to be operated effectively, obviously there's not a whole lot of latitude and there's really not a whole lot of critical thinking that needs to go into that. It's very procedural. Mm -hmm. If you're training somebody to problem solve, depending on the nature of that problem solving, it can be very, very adaptive, very flexible, and very difficult. So the nature of the task is gonna dictate the nature of the assessment. And then one final comment, my students always laugh when I say I have one more last thing to say. <laughs> one final comment, um, just to disabuse the folks here in the military, uh, yeah, at universities we have a lot of folks with um, high degrees and all that, but yeah, they don't know how to do assessment either. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I agree all yeah. around. I see yeah. hands over here. Yeah. Uh, someone has a mic that can reach these, these people here. Okay, uh, I, if I could ask a question. Okay. Um, working, training uh, the Army family, whether that's soldiers or civilians, we're a very end state focused group. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a little bit unique about us. And we have a, a growing emphasis on distributed learning, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hear, to throw in a little bit of lingo, your TTPs, your best practices, for distributed learning and really making it a social uh, activity and how to integrate group dynamics. I stopped teaching the pre-command course when it became distributed because I didn't know how to do it. I've, and I need to, to, to educate myself. And with these new digital natives, things are gonna look different than it, than it has with, with past cadres. And then I'd like to, after you're done, ask something about intake assessment. Any thoughts? So by digital, uh, by distributed uh, education, you mean? Non-classroom. Non-classroom. Correct. Online. Oh, on, okay, online. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there are virtual components, but, but often it's a series of slides or videotaped lectures or things like that that allow the students to participate at a time and place of, of Okay, so it's okay. asynchronous, primarily okay. online. Okay. okay, all right. Um, you know, I feel like I'm beating a, you know, a drum or a, maybe a dead horse, but you know, I think that the, um, the you have to have a, so, the, the internet allows for a social component, a social, you know, the, the, a collaborative social component to that learning. I, th I think, you know, just setting a, a series of slides is not gonna, not gonna do it and, um, well, so you get into an environment, very much like a flipped classroom, where you have, you know, you, if you're doing a, a presentation in a classroom, you know, and you, you must present the content like a, so that's five minutes. You don't want to do no more than five minutes of lecture or presentation before there is some type of engaged response on the part of the student to either interact with media or interact with other students. Um, and then, you have to have some type of um, process of um, self-assessment for information and self-assessment within the group, you know, a group assessment of, of the, the work of the group. So, but the, um, the internet allows for that type of interactivity. I think that that's the key to um, platforms for dialogue. I know that some, there's some chat platforms, even some, um, um, blogs that allow for uh, exchange of information, uh, guided uh, process for argumentation where, you know, you, the, you know, there are specific skills that are required for, say, scientific argumentation or mathematical argumentation, and you make sure that those elements are, are addressed during the online conversation, but it can be, it can be facilitated online, the both winner, synchronous and asynchronously. The winner this year of the, um, at the Learning Innovation uh, Conference uh, was the reverse uh, classroom where you'd, you'd get the lecture online, 
Like you said, when you can, then you come to class to do the homework, and you do it the homework in a group. One of the things I'd like to suggest, and I haven't seen it used uh, as much in, in my area, is using intake assessment not only to see what the students know and don't know, but to see who could be the teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. right. Who has, and because you don't only want to know the answer, but how did you get to that? And based on that, you may have resources in the, in the group that you can implement in a, in a dynamic way, and either in small groups or, or a, a project or something like that. Are you seeing assessment, pre-assessment used that way? Well, we, the, uh, we, talk, we try and establish heterogeneous groups when we establish group, you know, uh, uh, learning groups within a class. Um, sometimes that's done, and that, depending upon the, the instructor, that's done differently in terms of what kinds of skills they want. Well, certainly competency-based education does that, and I think they, that's, to me, where we need to move more toward is the idea that, yes, you come in, and if I take that assessment, Maybe I'm up here and I don't need to take this class, right? I mean, rather than you tell me you haven't taken the class, so you need to take the class, so now you're going to sit in the class, well, I mean, I, I know everything. Or maybe I'm not ready for the class. And I think that it's, it's finding ways to create more of that individualized instruction and individualized opportunities for students are really important. I think we have time for one more question. Do we have a mic over here? Yeah, um, Peter Harms, uh, University of Alabama. This morning, General Brown mentioned that one of the purposes would be to develop uh, character competencies and commitment. And so far, you've only been talking about competencies. I was just wondering, what would this look like if you had to talk about educating character or commitment? There are curricula for character, social skills. I don't know. Is there an opera, opera, operational definition of character? I, I don't know. We have definitions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me address that really. Please. Please. We have 21st century social competencies mm -hmm. written through our ALM or Army Learning Concepts. Uh, hi, I'm Casey Blaine from Fort Sill. Uh, in our ALM, or ALC as you address, we have 21st century soldier competencies. We teach our curriculum developers to write those things into the curriculum in order to show responsibility. So if, if soldiers are coming to the classroom and they're not prepared, what are the things, what are the th things we can key that you are not responsible, you're not accountable? We have a, a rubric code that we can do that too. So we write that into the curriculum and that is behavior in the classroom. That behavior, we hope, transforms into performance when they're on the job. Thank you. Okay. I've got a couple of announcements. Um, as you registered, you, you went into the room over here. Uh, to the left is a display, and we have uh, a book, uh, an edited book of papers uh, from uh, Dr. Daugherty, uh, Linton Wells, and Theodore Hales. I know Dr. Daugherty's here today. You may have a copy of this book if you choose. Uh, if you go in there, we, we ha I think we have uh, some enough for almost everyone here. Um, we're going to break for lunch. You heard the invitation uh, to go take the, the tour over at Lewis and Clark. We have buses available for that. Yes, sir? Hey, I just wanted, uh, sorry, I had to step out real quick, but I wanted to cover two innovations. I thought you know, it'll take a couple of minutes but I thought it'd be appropriate and it's, it'll give you an idea of the type of collaboration. Randy, I'm gonna ask you to talk the avatar, if you don't mind, from the Institute of Creative Technology. And I just wanna talk about, uh, we were talking about digital immigrants, digital natives. So one of our innovations, we were working with West Point and they took uh, the uh, history of the United States and uh, military history books that I fell asleep on some 35 years ago a really great series of books, but about a hundred years they'd been books where you read. And uh, they took that and they brought it to life uh, on an iPad in this case, but it could be any device. And it's very interactive. It's actually, uh, if you like history, it's almost addictive. You know, it, it's, it, uh, you, you'll open it up and uh, let's say you're looking at Normandy and hey, wait a minute, here's something on Bradley and there'll be a video. Oh wait, this is on this and there's, it's, it's, it's interactive, you're learning. 
And what happened was just incredible success. Uh, one of uh, General Burleson was sitting here. He's a uh, brigadier general, does a lot of our leadership work. His son was at West Point when this came out. He came home uh, on leave, and uh, he brought that home, and he and his dad spent hours going over history and this interactive. Now, I can tell you, I loved history. I never brought my history book home and spent hours with my dad when I was on leave from West Point. I guarantee you. Uh, in some cases, they showed an amazing, I think it was up to 47% increase in their retention. So not just that they, they enjoy it, they do it more, they really improve. We took that idea for the whole Army, and uh, what we did uh, for years, until recently, this year, we would have doctrine or our basic principles, you know, things that are proven. And it can be doctrine for cyber, doctrine for aviation, infantry. It doesn't, you know, tons of doctrine. I mean, there are, you know, literally thousands of pages of basic principles, and they, you know, it has to be a proven principle, and you work it, and they adjust over time. They always were written. This isn't one, but let's just say, you know, it's a written product, and uh, delivering it to the lowest guy in the field or, uh, you know, man or woman out there on the ground would be a written product to some type of written checklist that they would have. It doesn't work real well today in this complex world, nor did they, you know, we used to carry around manuals with us. They don't do that anymore, you know. I mean, and, and uh, we'll hear all the time, frustrated sergeants, majors, you know, s soldier can't do something. Say, Why don't they have the manual? They're not going to learn it. No matter what we do, they're not going to carry that manual around their pocket, but they will uh, go to their phone and download it and look at it to the point of need. Uh, and so what we've done, we have created what we call living doctrine. So we take the written and we bring it to life through interactive means, uh, podcast, video, uh, interesting scenarios. And then all doctrine now uh, is, is downloadable to the point of need of the soldier to their device. And believe me, that took a year to get the bureaucracy <laughs> to, to agree to that. But uh, downloadable to, and it's uh, Kindle quality. You can expand it, enlarge it, highlight it. And, uh, and then it's interactive, very similar to that history book. We call it Living Doctrine. And uh, it's not all doctrine. There's some that doesn't need to come to life. It's kind of boring. But there are other things that, uh, you know, I mean, it's just things you need to know, but you can't really bring it to life a whole heck of a lot. Uh, but there's other things that, that uh, we're seeing incredible success where you can demonstrate uh, something, and they're really learning and retaining and using it. So that's just an innovation as we look, and it's, uh, it bridges that gap as General Kem was saying, between kind of training and education, which I would argue with anybody, that gap, it used to be when I was younger, this clear divide. And that divide is a gray area, and it's back and forth uh, between education and training, uh, and, and uh, that has changed. The second one, just real quick, if Dr. Hill could talk about the avatar, because this is another very promising interesting thing, and I, I was given a talk on this at uh, Duke University, and the Secretary of Education was extremely interested in this. Uh, it's kind of like the gold star on the, on the uh, chalkboard uh, in the old days. Uh, so, Randy? No so, pressure. Not put on the spot no. at all. <laughs> uh, the Army has been investing at the University of Southern California in an in a institute called the Institute for Creative Technologies. And uh, one of the technologies we've been developing over the last 15 years is a virtual human, with, with, uh, which is basically, uh, it's an avatar that you can have conversations with. It understands natural language, but we're now getting it to the point where it, see, it can understand facial expressions, body language, and so on. We've applied it to a number of different areas for the Army. One of them is in leader development, so that you can practice counseling a subordinate. And it goes into this sharp area. We have scenarios now that deal with sharp and things like that. But it gives you the opportunity to fail with an avatar as opposed to failing with your subordinate, you know, in terms of how you counsel on performance issue, personal problems. And, then, uh, and just to expand that a little bit, that, that's exactly right. And again, education. But then we're looking at, so every soldier that comes in the Army would eventually have an avatar that replicates their characteristics and that would stay with them their entire career and grow as they grow as you're measuring factors like were mentioned earlier even negotiate you know, of course you could easily measure physical fitness you know marksmanship but what about negotiation skills and things like that so if you look you know and and right now we use a lot of simulation virtual and augmented reality to replicate the complexity of the world 
You know, uh, you don't want to train with two or three pieces of information when that soldier, when they go anywhere in the world, is going to get thousands of pieces of information. They become overwhelmed. So we replicate with uh, simulation. So if you have that, right now, the way our simulation is, every soldier is Superman or Superwoman. They all shoot perfectly. They run perfectly because there's no characteristics for those individuals in the simulation. The unit, there's characteristics. So we took a scenario, for example, of an actual scenario in Afghanistan where they had to reinforce a combat outpost because the enemy was coming to attack it. And we used a regular, everybody a superstar uh, scenario, and they won you know, against the enemy. Then we used actual characteristics from a squad, the exact same scenario, and they lost. One guy could never make it there. The best uh, marksman was, was uh, uh, killed early on. And so these, these, you know, if you can, and then what happens is in simulation, if it's replicating that individual, there's peer pressure to learn and get better even in simulation that just like peer pressure when you're doing it for real. So the buddies are pushing them, saying, hey, come on, you got to improve in this. You better improve your negotiation skills. And they go off, they do a module, they go from a 5 out of 10 to an 8 out of 10. Now when they're negotiating with an imam, it works. And so this is the thought, and you, you can look at, and some of the data would have to be coded so only commanders could see it, sensitive type things. But it would give you a real good picture throughout and motivate them and allow you. So that's where, uh, as we were discussing this, uh, some for teaching, uh, training, some for uh, you know, motivation and learning. Uh, that's where the Secretary of Education was really excited about the potential of that, like a, an avatar for students that would grow as they grow, say in math skills or English skills or whatever. So these are the type of things and when we talk about reaching out and what we can do, uh, you know, unlimited potential of, of not everything applies, but certainly a lot of it does. And innovation is just a tremendous job. Thanks very much. And sorry for interrupting there and, and cutting lunch short. So thanks. Thank you, sir. Let's thank our panelists, please. I think the buses for the first.